I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly, setting the stage. How President Biden and former President Trump are preparing for next week's debate. Rough waters. The Philippines responds to another incident with Beijing in the South China Sea, targeting the faithful. A Catholic hospital in Canada responds to a lawsuit over its euthanasia policy. We have analysis from Alex Schattenberg and trade school. Learn more about an unusual agreement between a Catholic abbey and a Baptist university. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the feast of St. Aloysius Gonzaga. Our top story tonight, the Supreme Court has upheld a federal gun control law intended to protect victims of domestic violence. The justices ruled 8 to 1 in favor of a ban on firearms for people under restraining orders from their spouses or partners. Justice Clarence Thomas represented the dissenting vote. President Biden praised the outcome, saying domestic abuse survivors can still count on critical protections. National Rifle Association released a statement saying, quote, the Supreme Court's narrow opinion offers no endorsement of red flag laws or of the dozens of other unconstitutional laws that the NRA is challenging. Here to talk more about the Supreme Court's decision is Don Dalton, executive director of the D.C. Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Don, thanks so much for coming on today. We appreciate it. Uh, first, explain the importance of today's decision for us. So what we know is over 30 years ago, the creation of this federal prohibition of domestic violence abusers having access to firearms when a protective order is in place against them created safety for many, many survivors of domestic violence over the last 30 years. And so what was really critical and key in this case was ensuring that those same protections remained in place and that survivors could rely on the federal law that has been in existence for the last 30 years. Yeah, and talk to us a little bit more about that. I mean, what this means, I mean, really means to those that are domestic abuse survivors, the ones that you work with too. So what we know about domestic violence is, and, and the intersection of firearms specifically, is that when there is a firearm in the home where domestic violence is occurring, the um, likelihood of um, homicide and murder to occur of the victim of domestic violence increases by five times. And so the, the reality that firearms poses a very lethal um, outcome for not only survivors of domestic, victims of domestic violence, but the community at large is so critical of an issue. Um, firearms has been a, an issue that we have been discussing as a country for quite some time. Um, I will say that the justice's decision to uphold the federal prohibition does keep in line with the regulation and, and names it constitutional, that survivors of domestic violence have this right to ensure that their abusers have this prohibition in place. Yeah, and this was really nearly a unanimous decision with both conservatives and liberal justices joining together for this eight to one decision. What is a signal to you? So I can I can talk about some of the exchanges that I've had with survivors throughout the day today and what this means to them. Um, and they had been these are um, survivors that we worked with in developing a brief that we filed in this um, Supreme Court case. We centered their stories, what their experiences were. Um, we let them give the rationale, give the reason as to why this prohibition needed to stay in place. And I had exchanges of tears, of overwhelming joy and elation um, that this um, federal prohibition remains in place. We know that there are survivors of domestic violence out there who have not reached out to help for help before, didn't know where to turn. At the end of the day, there are resources in every community across this country to assist survivors of domestic violence. No one deserves the, the abuse that is happening within their homes. We will continue to center the protections and, and needs that survivors have to ensure that domestic violence is working towards ending as opposed to scaling up. Yeah, and it's so important to know. And before we let you go, um, any final thoughts uh, or if people are in a situation like this, a domestic violence situation, and they feel like they have nowhere to turn to, what advice would you give them? We always tell folks, access the resources that are available to you, 1-800-799-SAFE, um, 
S-A-F-E, is the National Domestic Violence Hotline. They are a 24-7 resource to every person in the country that is experiencing domestic violence. They can connect you with local resources in your community to assist you and help navigate how to move forward into a safely move forward into another phase of your life. Um, what we also want to share for folks who are the support people in the lives of survivors is believe, believe them. Trust their timeline. They know the dangerousness of their particular abuser better than anyone else. It is a scary and overwhelming time. And actually the most dangerous time is leaving an abusive relationship. And so the survivor really needs to be the one making the decisions. Um, and sometimes it can be frustrating as a support person to see them make decision that doesn't make all the sense to you, but they know that situation best. And so knowing that survivors have options and that there is a support system for them on an ongoing way is so critical as we always are navigating to ensure safety. Absolutely, Don. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about this. We appreciate it. God bless. Absolutely. Take care. And while the Supreme Court did not issue a decision today on Donald Trump's fight for immunity, there was activity on a number of other cases connected to the former president. In New York, prosecutors are urging a judge overseeing Trump's criminal hush money case to extend the former president's gag order. They cited his, quote, singular history of inflammatory and threatening public statements originally issued before the trial. The order bars Trump from criticizing jurors, court staff, or relatives of the judge. Attorneys for the Trump for Trump asked the order to be lifted after the conclusion of the trial. All right, now to Florida, where U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon held a hearing on Trump's motion to dismiss the classified documents indictment against him. Lawyers for the former president are challenging the legality of special counsel Jack Smith's appointment. Smith charged Trump with hoarding classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago home. Attorneys argue the appointment was unconstitutional and therefore the indictment against Trump should be dropped. More hearings are scheduled for Monday and Tuesday. And in Washington, Steve Bannon, longtime ally to Donald Trump, has requested the Supreme Court delay his four-month prison sentence. He's asking for time to fight for his fight his convictions for defying a subpoena from the House committee that investigated the January 6th attack. This comes one day after a federal appeals court panel rejected Bannon's bid to avoid reporting to prison by July 1st. All right, six days and counting. That is when President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump will square off in a televised debate that could have huge consequences for both candidates in November. Abortion, inflation, global conflicts, the former president's recent conviction, and the current president's age all likely to be brought up right on stage in Atlanta. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Tracy, how both men perform in the debate next Thursday could be key. Currently, President Biden is hunkering down at Camp David preparing, and former President Donald Trump will stay on the campaign trail before heading to his Florida estate next week. President Joe Biden while on his way to Camp David last night, when asked by reporters how debate prep is going, gives them the thumbs up. On June 27th in Atlanta, he and former President Donald Trump, trying to win back his old job, will be standing just feet away from each other. How much they'll attack each other remains to be seen. But right now, no shortage of mudslinging. By the way, remember when he was trying to deal with COVID, he said, just inject a little bleach in your veins. <laughs> he missed it, all went to his hair. And the worst, most incompetent, most corrupt president in history is going to drag us into World War III. As the debate nears, Biden's team notes he cannot afford an underwhelming performance, while Trump's allies are pushing him to stay focused. Don't be surprised if it gets personal fast. Think about the guys you grew up with you'd like to get into the corner and just give them a straight lift. <laughs> I'm not suggesting we hit the president. He's the worst president ever. On debate night, some key rules. No audience. Each candidate's microphone will be muted, except when it's his turn to speak. No props or pre-written notes allowed on stage. And no opening statements.
A coin flip determined President Biden will stand at the podium to the viewer's right, while Trump delivers the final closing statement. Any stumbles will be hard to quickly erase the next debate not till September. And strategists on both sides agree nearly four months before Election Day, the political stakes could not be higher. Also tonight, campaign dollars. Last month in May, Donald Trump's campaign outraised Joe Biden's by more than $60 million. That's according to federal filings. Huge amounts came in after Trump was convicted in New York in that hush money trial. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, the governor of New York has signed a measure she hopes will protect children from the harmful effects of social media. The Safe for Kids Act requires social media companies to restrict addictive algorithms and feeds for anyone under the age of 18. The act will also bar notifications related to the feeds between midnight and 6 a.m. without parental consent. In response, several free speech groups claim the bill will violate the First Amendment by censoring free speech online. And here with analysis is Michael Toscano, executive director of the Institute for Family Studies. He is also a native New Yorker. Michael, good to be with you as always. Um, first off, your reaction to this landmark bill, which comes right on the heels of the U.S. Surgeon General saying earlier this week that warning labels should be on social media platforms. My, my initial reaction is one of uh, praise and gratitude uh, uh, toward Governor Hochul for her leadership on this. As you mentioned, I'm not just an, I'm a native New Yorker, but uh, I also have many nieces and nephews and friends and with children of very young ages who will be positively affected by this. It's becoming clear the U.S. Surgeon General's uh, call for putting health warning labels on social media platforms is becoming clear that there's a strong connection be between this and and negative uh, uh, social uh, mental health trends among adolescents. And so I'm just, I'm just really thankful. And it's great that New York is stepping up, a blue state and red states. It's a bipartisan effort, and, and uh, I think it's great. Yeah, coming together to protect our kids for sure. When is the act um, set to go into effect, and do you expect maybe some legal battles in the interim? Well, the the act won't go into effect until uh, till sometime later. But yes, there will certainly be legal battles uh, for uh, a lot of laws around the country that have been passed. There have been uh, there have been lawsuits against them to try to preliminarily enjoin them. And the mistake that these lawsuits uh, tend to make is that, as you you know, as you said above, is that they they claim that these are infringements on free speech. But the purpose of these platforms for young people is not to offer them opportunities for speech. It's to addict them to algorithms. And the value of these addictive algorithms to these companies is that it creates a lot of data um, that uh, they can, these companies can then sell so that way these young people could be advertised to by other companies. So when Governor Hochul goes after the power of these companies to addict them by algorithm, what she's doing is doing a kind of in, incision maneuver where she's she is breaking uh, these social media companies from the incentive to addict our kids. And I think this is not a speech issue. This is a health issue. Yeah, and really quickly before we wrap up, I mean, the Wall Street Journal just came out with a report just the other day uh, finding that Instagram, through its algorithm, suggests sexual videos and content to 13-year-olds. I mean, this despite pledges from the platform to give teens an age-appropriate experience. I quickly want to get your thoughts on that. And what do you think or what else do you think needs to happen to keep our kids safe from this harmful content? Well, I think that obviously that's abhorrent. Uh, the, the, the most important thing, I think, though, beyond what Governor Hochul has done, is to try to find a way to just get kids off of these platforms until they are of, of an age to deal with them in a mature way. And there are a variety of ways to do that. But I actually think that the best way to address this is that there needs to be safety on the devices through which they're accessing it, through their smartphones or through their tablets. And these these uh, devices have app stores that make a lot of money off of the advertising revenue that comes through having apps like Meta and uh, from Meta Instagram and other companies, TikTok, that are available to kids. So just like any other store, we need to apply ID. If you are old enough to, uh, you know, to get on these to get on these apps uh, on your desktop, then you should also be required to prove they're old enough to get it through the app store. Yeah, really great point right there. Thank you, Michael, so much for weighing in. We always appreciate it. God bless. Thank you very much. 
And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including assisted suicide in America. Lawmakers in Delaware vote on a measure to legalize euthanasia and analysis of a lawsuit against a Catholic hospital in Canada. Welcome back. Tensions in the South China Sea have reached a boiling point following the latest confrontation between the Philippine Navy and Chinese Coast Guard. Members of the Chinese Coast Guard boarded and used machetes and axes to damage two Philippine Navy boats. The Chinese also seized Navy rifles. Several Filipino Navy members were injured in the process. The Philippine military chief compared the incident to an act of piracy, demanding that China return the guns and pay for the damage. And joining us now to talk about this and more is Gordon Chang, author of The Coming Collapse of China and China is Going to War. Gordon, always good to be with you. So talk to us more about this incident between the Chinese Coast Guard and the Philippine Navy and what sparked it. Yeah, this incident occurred on Monday at Second Thomas Shoal in the South China Sea. And China claims Second Thomas and about 80 percent of that uh, critical body of water. Um, that claim has no justification in international law. And in fact, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague in 2016 ruled against China's claim in the case Philippines versus China. China, though, of course, is not deterred and it's using force to try to grab Second Thomas Scarborough Shoal, Sabina Shoal, and other uh, features that belonged to the Philippines, very close to the Philippines, very far from China. Yeah, and Gordon, this isn't the first time uh, there's been a confrontation in the South China Sea between the two nations, but it really does seem like China's aggression towards the Philippines has been steadily increasing. What's China's objective here? What's going on? Well, you know, my guess, Tracy, is that uh, Xi Jinping thinks that Taiwan is too hard a military target, and so he's decided to pick on something that he thinks is easier. And the Philippines has underinvested in its military for a very long time. There are about 7,000 islands in the Philippine archipelago. It's hard to defend all of them. And so I think the Chinese are looking for an easy win. Now, the problem here is that we have a mutual defense treaty with the Philippines, President Biden and the, his State Department have issued about a dozen warnings that the U.S. is prepared to use force against China to discharge our obligations to the Philippines. But the Chinese seem undeterred, which means essentially that deterrence has failed. Yeah. And Gordon, in your opinion, I mean, do you think this may reach a point where the U.S. will have to step in? Yes, um, because uh, China is going to push until um, it is causes something that cannot be unwound. So, for instance, Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. at the Shangri-La Dialogue a couple weeks ago said that the killing of a Filipino sailor, civilian or military, would be an act of war, and he probably would invoke uh, the 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty. Um, this is just a case of an aggressor going as far as it can. And until the United States actually does something, um, China is going to continue to push. So this is an extremely dangerous situation. Yeah, we're almost out of time here, Gordon. But, but I want to bring this up. Um, some new information about talks between the U.S. and China regarding nuclear threats uh, regarding Taiwan. Uh, that came out recently. What more do you know about this? Well, um, Beijing's representative of this Track 2 dialogue said that China would not use uh, nuclear threats um, in connection with uh, pressure on Taiwan. But, but China's already done that. It did that in 2021 and in 2022. Um, and China has used nuclear threats um, all throughout this century. So, you know, it's sort of like what Vladimir Putin did with Ukraine, threatened to use his most destructive weapons, gets the United States and uh, its friends to back down. And so the Chinese have seen this, and I think they're going to do the same thing as well, despite what they said at those Track 2 dialogue. Yeah, so much more we can talk about, but we have to leave right there. Gordon, always good to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, former papal nuncio to the United States, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, has announced on his website and in social media that the Vatican has charged him with the alleged crime of schism. 
An outspoken critic of Pope Francis, Vigano faces charges of making public statements that allegedly deny the fundamental elements necessary to maintain communion with the Catholic Church. This includes denying the legitimacy of Pope Francis and rejecting the Second Vatican Council. Vigano called the accusations against him, quote, a badge of honor. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, a college transfer of a different kind. A Catholic Abbey and a Baptist school really land a deal together. We'll tell you all about that. Lawmakers in Delaware vote against advancing a measure to legalize assisted suicide. But the vote was close enough that the bill could return for consideration next week. Ten states, along with the District of Columbia, have laws legalizing euthanasia. All right, new developments tonight in the case of a Catholic hospital in Canada facing a lawsuit for not providing assisted suicide. The parents of a terminally ill woman say their daughter had to be transferred to another facility in order to be euthanized after St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver refused to perform the procedure. This week, the parents filed a lawsuit. They want the Catholic hospital to lose its religious exemption. Hospital spokesman says St. Paul's is committed to providing compassionate care to all patients. For more on the story, we turn to Alex Shadberg, Executive Director of the Youth in Asia Prevention Coalition. Alex, welcome back. Good to see you. Um, First off, tell us a little bit more about this woman and how she ended up in a Catholic hospital in the first place. Well, this is the case of Sam O'Neill, and she had cancer. She was being cared for at uh, St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. She was in uh, palliative care, and then she had asked for uh, euthanasia made, which, as you know, was legal in Canada. And, of course, St. Paul's refused to do it, so they transferred her to another hospital where she did die by euthanasia. So she was she claimed she was denied her right to die or something, but in fact, she did die by euthanasia at another facility, but the lawsuit is about the concept that she should have been able to have it at the Catholic hospital. Yeah, it, it's hard to wrap your mind around that one. Um, the family says that St. Paul's violated their daughter's, quote, charter of rights and freedoms by not performing right the euthanasia procedure. Uh, what's this charter, and is there precedent for it to intersect with religious freedom? Uh, so this has been a big issue in Canada. In fact, there's uh, quite a few issues uh, related to this exact question. So we're referring to Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But the same case type of case is going on right now in Montreal because the Quebec government in June of last year passed Bill 11, which required all palliative care facilities in Quebec to provide euthanasia. Now, St. Raphael's Palliative Care Center in Montreal is run by the Archdiocese of Montreal, and of course they've refused to participate, but they were told, of course, by this legislation that they must do so. So right now there's a court case launched by the Archdiocese of Montreal to protect St. Raphael's right not to do euthanasia. Uh, this is not; These are not the first cases. There was a case in Nova Scotia similar to that with St. Martha's Hospital a few years ago, uh, where they were being pressured to also offer euthanasia. So it's based on this whole fact that the euthanasia lobby, they brook no dissent. They are saying all medical facilities in Canada must provide euthanasia. That's that's what they're saying, and that's what they're pushing for, and this is what it all relates to. Wow. What's been the reaction in Canada, and have church leaders said anything about this case? Uh, the case is pretty new, so... This case is, uh, I haven't seen a lot of response, but we know that the Archdiocese of Vancouver has been already dealing with this question because earlier uh, the uh, the same Dying with Dignity group were pressuring the British Columbia government to force uh, St. Paul's Hospital to do euthanasia. Uh, British Columbia government did something else which was very concerning. They expropriated a piece of property from the uh, Catholic health care, which is right beside St. Paul's, and they're building a euthanasia center literally beside the Catholic hospital, which was very concerning to me and everyone else, but that was not enough for Dying with Dignity and the euthanasia lobby people. They want to force the Catholic hospital to do euthanasia. That's their goal. Uh, this has been a goal for a while. They believe that this should be considered a right that you could have death inflicted upon you no matter where you're at. Alex, we have about 30 seconds left or so. What else are you following? 
Well, there's, there's been quite a few cases there. Very sadly, there's this case in Calgary of an of a artistic young woman who, uh, whose father has actually saved her life because he went to court to prevent her death by euthanasia. So all these cases re relate around this concept of how do you qualify for euthanasia in Canada? And our laws are very wide. They're, very, they're not defined. So you can have an autistic girl who's totally and completely healthy being approved for euthanasia, and it was only her father going to court that has prevented that death from happening. These are very sad cases all the way around, but you have this whole concept by the euthanasia lobby that there's some sort of right to be killed. Well, the fact of it is, is we need a right to be protected in law, not a right to be killed. Absolutely. It's really unbelievable some of the things that are happening. And thank you, Alex, for speaking up about thank all this. We appreciate much. it. God bless. Thank you. All right, well, finally tonight, an exciting agreement in Oklahoma between a Catholic Abbey and a Baptist University. St. Gregory's Abbey will receive 74 acres from Oklahoma Baptist University. In exchange, the Abbey is giving two parcels of land for future development. The land going to the Abbey had once been home to its university. In announcing the move, the abbot of St. Gregory quoted Proverbs saying, the bonds of Christian brothers are strengthened in times of adversity. We thank you for watching tonight. And remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.